Okay, so welcome back. Uh, there's one more thing I wanted to mention from our list actually um, about um, Oedipus is I forgot to mention if we're looking for mediators, uh, mediating figures, male and female, Tiresias would be a good choice because actually the story of Tiresias is that at various points, uh, Tiresias was uh, both male and female. Tiresias was transformed into a man, well, was transformed from a man to a woman and then back again. So had a kind of knowledge of both uh, male and female that other people did not possess. And I wonder if you wanna, you know, if you're talking about the story of, of like the male roles and the female roles, if Tiresias could say something that's kind of in between. Um, I don't know, we could maybe see him as a mediator. Uh, even though he appears as a man in this particular story, maybe we can connect it to those stories as well. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the PowerPoint here real quick. So I passed through this really quickly before. Um, so you might have seen in the book this chart. I think it's pretty badly laid out um, and it's kind of confusing. It's an attempt to um, explain how you might apply some Levi-Strauss things to the Zuni uh, creation myth. Uh, we looked at the Navajo, but we also kind of cameoed some other Native American creation myths, including the Zuni. And uh, Levi Strauss, in his original sort of famous article about his method, talks about this as well. But I think, A, his way of describing this is really confusing, and B, the book's um, uh, chart for it and way of describing it isn't that much better. Um, so I ended up making my own chart. Um, so here it is. Here's my version of the chart. I think this is what they were trying to say. Okay, so this is a chart with six categories. Um, we basically have a category for uh, agriculture. Um, we have a category for um, war and hunting. We have a category for honoring hero twins and harming the hero twins. And we have a category for um, the things that bring uh, the Zuni people more life and the things that uh, pe bring the Zuni people more death. Okay, so that's where we're going to go with this. So remember that this is a story about people who come up out of the earth um, and, um, and uh, are led by these hero twins who are um, these sort of heroic um, p powerful, significant figures in a lot of these Native American mythologies. There's some kind of uh, twins. Sometimes they guide the people. Sometimes they help the people um, in other ways. Sometimes they're the ones who lead them out of the out of the other world. Um, so they seem to be pretty important here. And then we also have the opposition between life and death. Um, so in the category of agriculture versus war, um, we have. Um, uh, basically, you know, growing plants in the ground, but also using plants, like using them as ladders to climb up out of the other world. Um, and so we have little myth themes that would go with that. Uh, the original chart puts hunting and war in the same category, but I'm going to explain why it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, but on the one hand, we have growing things, and on the other hand, we have killing things, basically. Then we have a lot of things in the story that seem to really honor the hero twins and say that they are um, great and uh, you know wonderful and to be worshipped. So they lead the people out of the emergence, um, and uh, when the people go on uh, on another journey to find a land to settle in, uh, there are again a, a pair of figures that lead them, and then there's two war gods that um, lead them when they go to war. Meanwhile, there are also situations where there's bad outcomes for the hero twins or the twins seem to be bad in some way. In the Zuni myth, the origin of water is when siblings commit incest, so that's bad. Um, at one point, they sacrifice a brother and sister to avoid uh, being flooded. Um, but um, another point, they trade them away for grain um, or they sacrifice them to gain victory in the war. Um, so there's definitely this tension between, you know, honoring the hero twins and maybe even just using them or killing them or sacrificing them in some way. And again, there's uh, uh, an opposition between life and death, 
We have um, a contest with the do people, this other people over food sources, and finding the center of the world. Uh, these are things that uh, save the tribe from dying, so sources of life. But then we also have the gods killing people, killing them by drowning. It's another flood story. And we have a war against this other people, the Kianque, who are these gardener peoples who know about agriculture. So we have this opposition between life and death as well. So if we were to try and think about the way that, pro, not prop, Levi Strauss would think about something like this, he would probably try to identify mediators and would try to identify how the mediators work to make all of these oppositions in our minds go away. Now you can't make life and death go away, uh, but you can make it feel like they've gone away by making other things uh, go away. Uh, so we could say agriculture is the opposite of war, Honoring the hero twins is the opposite of sacrificing them, and life is the opposite of death. Um, so what's in between here? What uh, mediates between them? Well, uh, the twins themselves kind of mediate between all of these categories. Uh, they're associated with um, life and death, um, and the story kind of uh, implies that they have knowledge of all things, including agriculture and war. Uh, but another thing that mediates is hunting. Hunting is in between agriculture and war, even though for whatever reason I listed it on this chart under war. Um, you know, hunting involves violence, but it also involves food. And so it involves life, but it also involves death. So even though there's no way to reconcile the fact that people die, first they're alive, now they're dead. Um, and you know, even though that's stressful, you can say that hunting is somewhere in between and the hero twins are somewhere in between. So the hero twins are kind of like hunting in a way. They're both mediators. Basically, Levi Strauss puts a lot of emphasis on these subconscious associations that people have in their minds, which just is a quality of the human brain, is to talk about things at the same time and then to imagine that they're connected in some way. And Levi Strauss says, this is the way that we solve our anxieties, deal with the stressful nature of mythology and you know, reconcile how paradoxical it can be. Um, it doesn't make sense that we treat the twins one way at this time and another way at this time, but we say, you know, that's how it is. It's uh, the way we do things, uh, like the fact that we go off hunting, if that kind of makes sense. Okay, and then building on this, Levi Strauss uh, talks about, and I think I talked about this at the very end, but it's a little confusing. Um, I went very fast, so. Levi Strauss says, imagine that people start off with an initial pair of opposites that can't be reconciled. That would be something like life and death. And so then they put uh, agriculture and war as things that are similar to life and death. Uh, you know, growing food gives you life, going to war gives you death or involves causing the deaths of other people. And then people notice something in between, which is hunting. Uh, it gives you food, it gives you life, but it also involves causing death. Levi Strauss says, from there we can develop another structure building off of this, which is that you have the herbivores versus the carnivores. And you see these in nature. Herbivores are creatures that are associated with life and with, you know, are like uh, growing crops. They eat plants, we eat plants. And um, whereas, and this really should be predator animals, but that's the way he phrases it. The predator animals, the carnivores, they cause death. Um, and so they're like when we're causing death. But there are some creatures that do not, um, that kind of fall in between. And these are the carrion eaters or the scavengers. They eat meat that has already been killed by other animals. And these are creatures like the raven and the coyote. And Levi Strauss basically says, it's not a coincidence that the raven and the coyote are so important in Native American mythology as figures that, um, you know, make things happen, uh, that change the world, that cause the origin of important things, because they have this status as being beings that are in between in some way. And they are mediators. They are mediating between um, uh, herbivore and carnivore, but they're also mediating between agriculture and war. Uh, they may be said to be, you know, these, um, able to teach the people how to hunt in some way. Um, and we could imagine that maybe the hero twins emerge from a similar process. We say something like, um, hero twins, are they one person or two person? The two people. Well, they're in between. 
um, they are one and yet they're two. Um, so maybe that could be another way to fill out this chart specifically for the Zuni. Um, so, um, and then naturally the hero twins would be people who could teach you about hunting or had caused hunting to happen in some way or were wise about hunting. And all of these mediating figures, whether they're like the raven or the coyote or the hero twins would be able to be somewhere in between life and death. And maybe that's why the reason, the reason why the hero twins give life, but they're very frequently killed. And uh, Levi-Strauss particularly identifies a kind of mediator he calls a trickster. And we're going to talk about them more on Tuesday because they're really interesting. Um, tricksters are figures that are very much in between in a lot of different categories. Um, they're kind of in between good and evil and they're in between life and death. And in the Native American tradition, they're often, um, uh, uh, you know, these scavenger animals. Uh, but around the world, we see different kinds of trickster figures um, usually they do something important and they trick people. They trick people into doing something, but sometimes they get tricked themselves. Um, so these figures who are in between are very important for like the foundational myths of the culture. You know, when a culture says, what's most important? What do we value the absolute most? Here's another one from uh, the chapter. Uh, now this is not quite, um, ex you know, not quite the same thing as um, as uh, we we see in other charts. Sorry, I'm being confusing here. It's not quite the same as other charts because um, we're not trying to uh, develop something that's in between. It's more that um, this is a comparison of two different mediator figures, and these are Ashboy and Cinderella. So Cinderella uh, is from a European tradition, and you know. Uh, the story is very much, um, you know, we know the story of Cinderella. She was raised in the ashes. She was um, named after the ashes, the cinders. And then uh, she uh, finds her prince and she gets, re uh, she goes off to um, join the prince and lives happily ever after. But she has this step family who are cruel to her. She's a beautiful girl, but she's unrecognized because she has dirty clothes. But then her fairy godmother gives her beautiful clothes and uh, nobody likes her. Uh, now compare this to the story of Ash Boy, um, where we have um, a male figure who um, is an orphan. He has no family um, and he is an ugly boy. Um, and he is in love with this girl, but she doesn't love him back because he's ugly. But then a magical force uh, transforms him into being a handsome man and he lives happily ever after uh, magically. So if we were to try and make charts out of these, let's switch over to um, the, uh, the, the Word document here and let's see if we can uh, do something with that. Okay, so we, we've got the Zuni, see the PowerPoint for that one. Uh, we've got uh, Cinderella. So Cinderella, um, she, uh, what if she is a, a figure, a character that mediates between things, what does she mediate between? Well, beauty versus ugliness and goodness versus evil in a way. Uh, she's not in between good and evil, but her story kind of is about that. Her story is about she is beautiful um, and good, but she is not recognized. Um, so, because she is poor. So she is poor, but she should be recognized as beautiful um, and she should deserve to be rich and to be happy and things like that. But she is tragically, um, you know, in a place where nobody can recognize her beauty because she is uh, poor. Um, she is in ugly clothes. Then what happens? She's magically transformed in her clothes um, so then she goes to the ball. She's treated like a rich, a beautiful person uh, in magical clothes. Um, and uh, she ends up marrying the prince and she ends up becoming rich. She ends up joining the upper class. Meanwhile, her stepsisters um, pretend to be very beautiful, but they're ugly on the inside. They're evil. Um, so this is saying, you know, that they are uh, evil that appears to be uh, beautiful. Or sometimes they're called the ugly stepsisters, in which case they are just ugly and evil. But 
um, you can see how there's kind of this paradox of, um, you know, is Cinderella in the right place that she's supposed to be? Um, because the, the thought process going on in the back of the minds of the people who are hearing the story is something like, well, if she's beautiful, she should deserve to be uh, happy. And if she's, um, and to be rich and to be recognized. So let's put uh, unrecognized versus, versus recognized. And so she goes um, and moves between these two categories over the course of the story and her stepsisters are revealed to be evil. They were evil unrecognized uh, when the birds peck out their eyes and they are punished. Um, and maybe that says to make them uglier as well. Um, chopping off their feet probably doesn't help. Chopping off parts of their feet probably doesn't make them any less ugly. So Prop would, uh, sorry, Levi Strauss would say that this is all a story about um, finding your correct place in the world and being recognized for being beautiful and good. Um, even though you start off in poor circumstances, it's okay because you end up becoming a rich person by the end of it. Ash Boy would probably be a very similar story. He's ugly, but he becomes beautiful. Um, and he um, is, has a no family. Um, so there's a story about family here. Cinderella is in between two families. And Ash Boy is in between no families. Um, and so he is, you know, isolated and has no love. Um, so he goes from loveless to being loved. And again, this magical factor that uh, causes this transition between the two categories. That would be the way these stories are kind of similar because they're all about this sort of movement from, um, from a bad place to a good one, riffing on the themes of ugliness and beauty. Okay, I want to talk about a few other examples as well. In Greek mythology, we talked a lot about the Golden Age versus the Iron Age. So the Golden Age, what have we got? We've got, um, we've got um, people eat um, uh, fruit off trees. They don't need to work for the food. They eat the fruit off the trees. They live a really long time. Uh, they, um, uh, they are happy and they hang out with gods. And the big contrast for someone like Hesiod is with the Iron Age, um, where um, we have, um, uh, you know, you have to work for your food, die, you die young, and have to reproduce. Uh, you're miserable. I'm gonna space these out a bit more. And um, the gods are far away. Now, if we were looking for mediators, maybe the natural process is that we come up with something like an explanation for how we went from one state to the other. Uh, so you come up with something like uh, the Bronze Age. Um, not the historical Bronze Age, but the one that Hesiod talks about, um, where um, they uh, have to work a bit more for the food. Uh, they live uh, longer but die young because uh, they're because they're violent. Um, they are heroic, but um, but angry, not terribly happy, and they are often sons of gods or they threaten the, the gods, but uh, they don't have a positive uh, relationship with the gods. So Levi Strauss would argue that this is kind of the process by which uh, something like this is developed. Um, but there's also the relationship between humans and gods. Um, so we could put something like um, gods, uh, they, um, they um, what do they do? They eat 
ambrosia and the smell of the sacrifice. Um, they live forever. Um, they are perfectly happy. Um, although in a weird way, um, it, there's a weird thing in Greek mythology where the gods are always described as blissful, except clearly in the stories they get angry over things. But let's say that they don't have any problems, you know, they don't have any real problems. They just cause their own petty arguments is the way the gods are. Um, and that's sort of what we mean by perfectly happy. They are the gods um, and they are superior to human beings. And then, you know, the opposite would be humans, right? Humans we uh we eat uh food work for it we have to work for our food we live tragically short lives um all this is the iron age stuff really um stress and problems um and um uh inferior to the gods But there's some other ways to look at it, actually. Um, let's, yeah, okay. So we could put, the, the, there's a couple of different ways to do this. So I'm gonna copy and paste this. We could put um, the golden age people in between gods and humans. And there's some other figures in mythology, like uh, the people of, oh, the Phaeacians. Uh, Odysseus meets these guys on the way to, um, uh, to back to his home and uh, they are they live far away from um, normal society, but they are very close with the gods um, They and what do they do they have wonderful food uh, That they don't have a hard time getting the the land is very abundant So they're feeling very similar to the golden age type of people uh, they live long, ha long lives. They're fairly happy. And they hang out with the gods. So those would be, um, that, those would be figures that would be in between. These would be mediators between gods and men. And that's exactly what someone like Odys Odysseus in his story might be looking for is mediators between gods and men. They have this special relationship with the gods, and so they can, uh, you know, kind of get them on your side in a special way. And these are people who are happier than the norm. They are godlike in a way, um, but uh, they do not, um, you know, they, they do not actually live forever like the gods do. On the other hand, you could also do it this way, um, which is that um, on the, we have an other extreme instead of humans. So humans, what food do they eat? Um, well, they eat uh, bread that they grow, but they also um, eat meat. So human beings eat cooked meat. Yeah, and actually I'll make that another thing on this chart here. So human beings eat cooked meat and gods eat the smell of the meat in the sacrifices. So human beings make the, have this meat and then they uh, sacrifice the animal to the gods. Um, so this is about the relationship that human beings have with the gods. On the other extreme, we have monsters like cyclopses and to some extent uh, barbarians, foreigners that aren't part of Greek culture. Oops, gotta pull that in a bit, a little bit here. Okay, so monsters, what do they eat? They eat raw meat and they're cannibals. They eat this uncooked meat and sometimes they eat human beings. Um, like the Cyclops in the Odyssey is like this. And so this is how humans are in between gods and monsters. So human beings are in the proper place in this version and very often mediating figures um, are a sign of either what you absolutely do not do or absolutely what you should do. In this case, it's what human beings should do. Human beings should make sacrifices to the god and cook their meat. Whereas monsters um, uh, should, uh, monsters uh, are, are evil and bad and they do not do this. 
whereas the gods have this state of perfection that we can't aspire to, um, but um, but we can we can dream. So the humans in this one are the mediators, while in this the previous one, the golden age folks or the Phaeacians were the mediators. Tap tap tap. Make it a little more readable. I know this part is riveting. Uh, there we go. Okay, so isn't it interesting that humans can be the mediators, um, and they but they can also be um, be you know one extreme of a spectrum. Um, so basically, you can put mediating figures in between anywhere you want. Um, humans are mediators, I guess, when we're trying to explain the origins of society, uh, explain the origins of the sacrifices we make and, um, you know, the proper relationship to the gods. Um, this part is about the proper relationship to the, to the gods. On the other side, we have monsters who don't respect the gods and need to be destroyed. Um, they fit into this other category. And it's interesting that the monsters don't work. They are, the, uh, the Cyclops is a shepherd. Uh, you know, which arguably is, is a lot of work, but it's not, it's not growing, you know, uh, having a farm. So it doesn't count according to Greek mythology. So the shepherds are barbarians and very often non-Greeks were thought of as people who were, um, you know, all shepherds, no agriculture, uh, because that's what they saw other barbarian cultures doing. Um, so this is, a, you know, a non-Greek, this and to some extent, a non-human in this mythology. Uh, monsters, uh, their lives, they need to die. Um, their state of happiness, um, they just sort of live for the moment. Um, and they are inferior to humans. If you want to fill out this chart. Um, and what I find so interesting is that um, one thing that another Levi Strauss works talks about um, is that Human beings, you know, they live in the normal world. But if we ask where the gods are, they uh, they live outside uh, civilization. Um, you uh, you can go and uh, meet the gods like Poseidon when you're on a journey like Odysseus. You're outside of the normal world that you come to, the normal civilization. Uh, the cities that everyone knows. That's where you find the gods. But it's also where you find the monsters. Um, and it's just like, the further away you go, the farther you go from the way the world normally works, the way human society is supposed to work, the farther you go into the extremes on either end. You get to absolute gods and you get to absolute monsters. And it's pretty telling to me that the people, like the Phaeacians, um, who are reported as being kind of like the gods are seen as far away from human society. They're, you know, the, you go, you start going away from um, the normal world and then you run into people like this who exist in a different way. And another way to go is to go a long time ago, whereas you have the golden age. The further you go back, the more people were like gods or the further away you go, the more people are like gods. But, um, it also seems like the further away you go, the more you encounter monsters and uh, barbarians. And I feel like there was one more thing I was gonna say about that, but I'm blanking on it. Oh yeah, just that um, Odysseus is, um, you know, he's on his way home. And so when he crosses sort of the, the path back home from the gods to the humans, you might say, um, that's when he goes uh, between um, the gods and the humans, so he visits the Phaeacians very naturally. They are on the edge of uh, this border between gods and humans, and so naturally they uh, fit into that category. Um, and I think it makes sense that he encounters a lot of monsters as well. Uh, but uh, these guys would be like the transition because they're right on his doorstep. He's almost home when he gets to the Phaeacians. Okay, so Hopefully this gives you guys some more perspective on some of the uses of Levi-Strauss's techniques. I think, you know, you don't have to necessarily buy Levi-Strauss's argument over a particular myth and what he thinks it means to see the way that this technique can be useful. That's my take anyway. Uh, you guys may have your own take, but 
I would encourage you to think about, you know, what do you think? How useful is Levi Strauss's technique? Uh, I'm going to challenge you guys to um, make use of Levi Strauss's techniques for a particular myth and come up, you know, with your interpretation of what does the myth mean if we use a technique like this that has an emphasis on opposites and mediators. So kind of what you've done already, but let, let's take it a step further and let's go all the way with a particular myth. Or alternatively, uh, if you want, you can talk about Levi Strauss's take on the Oedipus myth and if you would do that particular myth differently. All right, I'll see you guys in the discussion. I can close out here. <laughs>